This is the latest installment of the astrophysicist's attempt to understand the universe. And in particular, with that telescope, it enables us to more fully understand the risks of asteroids that go bump in the night. But let's back up, let's back up. Every 10 years, there are chosen members of my community, the community of astrophysicists, gather and discuss priorities for the next 10 years. What do we want to see built? What do we want to see observed? Where do we want to go? in space. And this is what generates what we call the Decadal Survey. And I had the privilege of being one of the committee members in 2010 when the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope was being proposed. In fact, it wasn't named for anybody yet because it didn't exist yet. And here's a letter that came with the book, the science book of the LSST. And it's to the members of the Decadal Survey Committee. And it introduces the contents of this book so that we can think about it, evaluate it, and judge whether the allocation of money, scarce resources from the National Science Foundation, uh, from NASA, from private donations, as money arises within the decade to come, how will we apportion it? What are the priorities that we establish for ourselves as a community? That's how we get stuff done. The Hubble telescope was in a decadal survey. The VLA, the Very Large Array Radio Telescope, that was a project that came out of the decadal survey. So we come together and we duke it out. Is that the right phrase? I don't know. We pitch our best science. And since those in the decadal survey are among the most trusted within the community, if a project is elevated or reduced in priority, it's done with some sense that things landed where they needed to, where they should be, for the greater good of the astrophysics community. Well, money's got allocated, and what was the goal of this telescope? To not simply image the sky, that's what every other telescope, this large synoptic survey telescope would take multiple images of the sky every single night, stringing them together and basically making a movie. A movie of the night sky. Now we don't think you need that naively because you look up at the night sky, the star is there tonight and it's gonna be there tomorrow night and the night after that and the night after that. But how do you discover things that change? Well, we could do it passively and say, oh, that star just got really bright. I wonder when that happened. Did it happen an hour ago, overnight, yesterday? I wasn't looking yesterday. These are how supernovae were discovered, stars that blow the guts up into the surrounding environment. That phenomena takes hours. But if you're not looking at it while that happened, you missed it. You just see the end result and you saw what it was before any of that happened and you missed everything in between. So we know that stars vary in brightness. We call them variable stars. They'll vary over days typically. The fast ones are 12 hours, 24 hours. Others will vary over weeks, some months. That's a time scale you can come back to the telescope, take an image, oh, it got a little brighter, oh, it got a little dimmer. We, we, had, we, took, we felt comfortable with that. But wait a minute, suppose a star varied within just hours and then went back to what it was. How, how would you know? You would miss it. So what the Vera Rubin telescope will do is time sample, that's the term, the official term, time sample the phenomenon, not on a sequence of days, but hours and even minutes. So that if something varies on those shorter timescales, it'll get captured for the first time ever. Well, suppose a star got brighter once every 24 hours. The sky is huge. It is huge. Most telescopes see tiny fraction of the night sky. For example, the Hubble telescope sees a tiny fraction of the area of the full moon on the sky, the tiniest fraction. If you would take a picture with the Hubble telescope of an area of the sky the size of the full moon. It is individual exposures linked together mosaic until you recover the full area you're interested in. If we're gonna take a movie of the night sky and watch things that change, we wanna do better than that. One of the main features of the LSST telescope is the size of its camera. The LSST camera is the largest digital camera ever made is the size of an automobile. It weighs 6,000 pounds. The detector is called a CCD. It's what's in all of your phones, charge couple device. And it digitally records what's out there across the entire focal plane of this telescope, which is so large. Its field of view can image 50 full moon. So now you just pop an exposure and then slew the telescope, get another one next to it. And what you end up mosaicing is the whole sky visible to you in a very short amount of time. 
By the way, the field of view is so large, it is larger than what can fit on the display of your computer screen. What do I mean by that? You can put it on your screen, and then you can zoom in and zoom in, and you can keep doing this before you have exhausted the resolution of the image, which happens when it matches the resolution of your screen. I invite you to visit, I think we'll probably put the link down there somewhere, where you can zoom into these images yourself. Oh, by the way, we put telescopes in places where there's not many clouds above you. So we put telescopes in high places. Uh, this one in the Andes Mountains of Chile. My thesis data many moons ago were obtained in the Andes Mountains of Chile. And you have excellent access to the Southern Hemisphere while you're there. There was engineering runs many months ago. That's where engineers check to make sure everything is doing what it's supposed to. And then there's what we call first light. Very poetic and beautiful statement of when the first science is obtained from a telescope that's been under construction. So in the first data release, which is in all the news, you take a look at an image and you see some galaxies and some, some stars. Yeah, I expect that. But wait a minute, it's a movie. All of a sudden you see some of these objects are not stationary. They're booking across the field of view. There's another one going that way. And then this way. These are undiscovered asteroids, never before documented by any prior scientist or telescope. How many asteroids did it discover? Might you ask? It discovered more than 2,000 asteroids in the first 10 hours of operation. By the way, we discover a lot of asteroids every year, tens of thousands of asteroids. So I don't want to play down the significance of the world's effort to discover asteroids. But if we discover tens of thousands of asteroids in a year, and the Rubin Telescope discovered 2,000 asteroids in 10 hours, that's a month's worth of asteroids in 10 hours. And by the way, this tranche of more than 2,000 asteroids, that's just in one section of the sky. There's more sky that we're gonna learn about, and we fully expect millions of asteroids to be discovered that had never been cataloged before. You realize in the next few years, the Vera Rubin Observatory will discover more asteroids than have been cataloged in the last two centuries. That's science on the move. That's astrophysics, reaching out for the universe, taking names. This telescope will also be able to map large scale structures of the universe, galaxies, and this will give us insights into the nature and the distribution of dark matter. And we should be able to increase our data set that helps us understand the accelerated expansion of the universe, which is some phenomenon going on. We don't know what's causing it, but we can measure it. And we call that dark energy. Well, there's a colleague of mine, she's deceased a few years now, called Vera Rubin. She published a paper which basically discovered dark matter in galaxy, dark matter. You know what it literally is? It's dark gravity. There's more gravity out there than any known source of matter. By the way, it's something like 20 terabytes of data per night that has to be processed. And, and so obviously there's no people involved in that. <laughs> well, people created the data pipeline, but the analysis, that's all automatic. Otherwise it would take thousands of astrophysicists, thousands of years to analyze these data. So a feature of this telescope is that the public owns it in a sense, because all of the data will be made public as soon as it comes out of the processing stream. And that means with some tools that my colleagues will be developing, you can help us discover things that we might have missed. Not everyone knows what question to ask of data. You can have your own biases, your own expectations. And so the this gives new meaning to the concept of citizen scientists. So I look forward to what role the public plays in this going forward. So that's a little bit of what's up with that, with the Vera Rubin Observatory.